Well, thank you, Stan, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for having me here today. I am honored to be here and to be able to speak to you about bringing life experiences into the college classroom. Uh, before we begin, I think I need to explain that picture on the screen. That is a monument in Kiev, Ukraine, of the Vikings that founded Ukraine as a trading post. Um, they went up the Dnieper River in a longboat and created a trading post in Kiev, and from that trading post, the city of Kiev eventually grew. Uh, there were three brothers and a sister on that longboat, and one of the brothers' names was Kiev, and that's how the city got its name. So uh, before you all arrived, we were playing around with different pictures, uh, and we decided on that one. It was such an interesting picture. So I need to talk to you today about bringing life experiences into the college classroom. Um, I'm not going to include any of the experiences that Stan and I had in Poland. <laughs> I don't think they were really that relevant for my students. We don't realize how valuable our life experiences can be as teaching tools. If we think of our life experiences as usable tools for teaching and use them to connect in the classroom, they can help students grasp and retain concepts that might be otherwise soon or more easily forgotten. Even so, I know from experience that there is a right way and a wrong way. The major thing is to avoid talking so much about our own lives that we neglect the course material. I should point out at this point that my wife says, you say you shouldn't talk so much about your own life, but yet your speech is just filled with all kinds of things about your own life. So I, I tried different ways of doing this thing and decided that I needed to talk about some of my own life experiences that I use in the classroom. Before beginning, it's important I communicate to you something that I became increasingly aware of from my teaching in Central and Eastern Europe. Teaching in the Western world has evolved in a way that is still in process in Eastern Europe. This is partly due to the lack of current, updated, state-of-the-art teaching materials but it is also due to an antiquated method of teaching. 21st century education requires that we no longer deliver a canned lecture to eager students who will in turn memorize it and recite it back verbatim. Teachers are now more than ever engaged in cooperative learning that involves a relationship between the teacher and the student. Lecturing is increasingly replaced by interactive learning and memorization is increasingly replaced by interactive relationship. I've considered several approaches to presenting this material today. I've decided to summarize some of my life experiences, share what I have learned, and give you examples of experiences that I have used in the classroom. First, I grew up on a farm, but my father was not a farmer. He was a service manager for Pangborn Corporation in Hagerstown, that made blast cleaning and dust control equipment. My mother, my older brother, and I did all the farm work. When my father came around to see what we were doing, that usually meant you were in trouble. We started farming in 1941 when I was three years old. We had dairy cows, hogs, sheep, chickens, ducks, workhorses, and 75 acres of land. My job from a very young age was to look after the sheep. I had to make sure that after the cows and everything else were in, that the sheep were put into the feeding rooms of the barn. And so my job was to look after the sheep. In 1952, when I was 14 years old, we only had beef cattle and sheep. But my father had bought a second farm about three miles away that was 150 acres. In 1952, I was sowing wheat with a grain drill and our formal tractor. I saw my father's car pull into the field and knew that something was amiss. I waited until he walked down to where I had stopped the tractor. He said, your brother has run away again, and I'm not going to go get him this time. The farms are yours to operate. 
and he turned and walked away. Well, we had two farms totaling 225 acres and over 100 head of beef cattle, and I was only 14 years old. But I was surprised but not crushed by this as I liked the farms and the animals and would now be in charge. It would be a challenge, but it was to involve many interesting experiences for me from which I gained immensely. This also meant that the farms would take priority over school. I did okay in school, but had no time for extracurricular activities. I learned to be quite creative in finding ways to get my work done. After my senior prom, I had several of my friends in tuxedos help me haul in hay at dawn. And uh, they had a good time. Of course, I furnished the beer, and that made it even more fun. <laughs> Experiences from the farm that I can share in my economics class include, production does not happen just because you have land, labor, and capital. Someone has to manage, plan, organize, coordinate, and make the results occur. We call that entrepreneurship. In business as in life, unexpected things happen. Be prepared for them. On a farm, machinery breaks, thunderstorms happen, droughts occur, the cows break through the fence, and prices fluctuate. If you have a business that involves animals, treat them with kindness. Abused animals can be very uncooperative and take additional time to manage. One important lesson I learned on the farm that I share with my students is that success in anything always involves assuming responsibility. I had to assume responsibility to plant and harvest crops correctly and at the proper time. I had to take responsibility for the cattle, count them every day, help them have calves, and put them in the barn and feed them in winter. Machinery won't operate very long unless it is lubricated and kept adjusted. Cash crops and cattle must be sold on a timely and profitable basis. Success will not occur unless you assume responsibility. When I graduated from high school in 1955, my father announced he was selling the larger 150-acre farm, the machinery and the cattle, and was going to start a housing development on the smaller farm. I wanted to stay on the farm, but he told me that was a dumb idea and offered no future. You never argue with my father. He, he always declared things, and that was it. You, you never bothered to argue with him about anything. So I went to work at Pangborn Corporation as a draftsman and attended Hagerstown Community College in the evenings for three years. In 1955, I also became a charter member of the Leitersburg Volunteer Fire Company and was appointed a driver. Our pumper was a 1936 Chevrolet, and I had the honor of tearing the crankshaft out of it three times before the fire chief decided that it really wasn't my fault. It's because we were pulling into the creek and putting the front end of the fire truck at an angle, which then put the... the the crankshaft that extended out through the front of the truck at a, uh, under stress and it caused it to break. So it really wasn't my fault. It was because we were not handling the truck properly. From this job college experience, I learned some important things that I share with my students. Do more than is asked of you. You will stand out for it and will often lead to unexpected success. Expand your network of friends. I learned to play golf and played regularly with three other fellow workers. There's something worthy in all new experiences. They broaden and deepen your life. Appreciate teachers. Their rigorous requirements are challenges for you. You are likely to be capable of much more than you think. I had two very positive teacher experiences at this time that I share with my students. In my senior year of high school, I was mistakenly put into an academic English section, even though I was a general curriculum student. The teacher, Rachel Sheets, had very high standards and was an excellent teacher. A term paper was required in the course, and Ms. Sheets had a definite procedure for completing it. 
My paper was entitled General Daniel Edgar Sickles, His Career in the Civil War. I carefully followed Mischietz's procedures and included battle maps, pictures, and anecdotes about General Sickles. Ms. Sheets picked my paper as one of the three to be presented to the class. This was my first experience in public speaking. My second experience was in zo zoology class taught by Mabel Walters at Hagerstown Community College. During the third evening lab, she asked me to stay after class. I did so, and she told me she had discussed my work with the president of the college, Atlee Kepler. They concluded that I was wasting my time and their time. She suggested that I either become an A student or go do something else, like pump gas. <laughs> I heeded her advice, began studying hard, brought my grade up to an A, and discovered that it was easier to be an A student than it was to be a CD student. The CD student says, I wonder if that will be on the test. The A student says, go ahead, ask me anything. I've mastered this subject. And that made being a student a whole lot easier for me once I figured that out, that uh, it was a lot easier to be an A student than a CD student. The University of Maryland was a whole new experience for a farm boy from Western Maryland. My original plan was to major in farm management and operate a beef feedlot upon graduation. But by my senior year, I had come to understand how much of a financial investment that was going to require and began to look for an alternative. My faculty advisor suggested I take a second minor in statistics and go to work for the statistical reporting service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Their Maryland Delaware field office was actually in the agricultural building at the University of Maryland. I took the second minor in statistics, graduated in 1961, and acquired a job with the Statistical Reporting Service. Upon starting work, I discovered the frustrations of government work. My first task was to edit, edit survey questionnaires from egg farms. I completed it in two hours and took them to the chief statistician. He told me that job was supposed to take me two days, not two hours. He had nothing else for me to do, so I was to take them back and go through them again and see if I had missed anything. So I fiddled around with those questionnaires for two days. Another time I was instructed to prepare the first cattle on feed estimate for Maryland. Using a statistical model of small feed lots, and a personal survey of large feedlots in Maryland, I prepared and documented an estimate of 36,000 cattle on feed and took it to the chief statistician. After looking at my calculations, he said, well, we have more than New York, but not as many as Virginia. I think we'll go with 50,000. All of my work was wasted. He just picked a number out of the air and for all I knew, the estimates for New York and Virginia were guesses also. So my big assignment was to go to Salisbury every Tuesday and put out the weekly broiler chick report each Wednesday. This was eggs set, chicks hatched, and chicks placed. I think that was the three things you had to verify. And from that, you could predict how many chickens were going to hit the market in 16 weeks, I think, or 10 weeks, however long it took to grow a chicken. And um, so I had to work with all the baby chook hatcheries on the Delvar Delmarva Peninsula and also document hatching egg and chick imports and exports to and from Delmarva. It was an interesting and challenging experience with my limited knowledge of chickens. Experiences from this chapter in my life include a number of things I can share with my students. Every job involves learning experiences. They may not be what you expected. However, don't discount how new learning can be useful to you in the future. Don't be afraid to take on a new and challenging task. And once you have, determine to complete it. I learned to put out the weekly broiler chick report all by myself even though I knew little about chickens. This required that I 
visit and become familiar with all the chick hatcheries that engaged in contract production of chickens. I never ceased to be fascinated when they opened the drawers of the incubators and hear all these little yellow balls of down peeping away. I, I would just, I, I learned from my mother to be, to like animals and I could never, I was just continually fascinated by all these baby chicks. And uh, so whenever I went to visit them, I always asked if I could go into their incubator house and, and, and look at their incubators because then they'd open them up and I'd get to see the baby chicks. Sometimes you'll work on a project with supervisors as a joint effort. In government work, you have to obey orders and not create conflict with your superiors, even if you think or know they are wrong. My survey work with the University of Maryland Extension Service personnel led to a job offer as a regional development research agent on the university staff in 1965, or 63. This resulted in a continuation of my survey work in Maryland, along with a series of publications regarding economic development. Two of these were regional development studies of Southern Maryland and Western Maryland. I also did a drought damage study, a survey of timber use in Western Maryland, and a survey to estimate tobacco production prior to sale. While doing this, I was also taking graduate courses. I finished a master's degree in 1965. From this, I learned there can be politics involved in research. My major professor had my master's thesis published. It was entitled um, Alternative Beef Cattle Production Systems in Maryland. And it was based on a survey uh, all through Maryland of beef cattle production methods. But after he had my master's thesis published as a research publication, he then destroyed all the copies of it because he thought that it would offend the agronomy department and the animal husbandry department because one of my major results was that farmers were overfeeding protein. The agronomy department was pushing them to produce alfalfa and clover hay, and the animal husbandry department was pushing them to feed protein supplements. So, with all this going on, there was a lot of protein just passing through the animal and not doing any good at all. But he didn't want to upset the other departments, so he destroyed my publication, and that was the end of that. Remembering this experience with my master's thesis, I remind students to be aware of politics, even in education, and watch for it as they move through life. In 1966, I was offered a job in the Natural Resources Division of the Economic Research Service of the Department of Agriculture. Because of my experience with a linear programming model in my master's thesis, they wanted me to design a similar model of United States agriculture, including over 20 river basins in the United States. Developing the model was not as difficult as was acquiring the data to make the model functional. However, the model was completed and it was used to make projections of U.S. food production to 1980, 2000, and 2020. A job funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce opened in Calvert County, Maryland in 1968, and a friend suggested that I apply for it. I did and was hired as Economic Development Director of Calvert County in 1969. At that time, Calvert County was a rural area producing only tobacco and crabs as cash crops. All the people there were descendants of the original colonial settlers, and few ever left the county even for a visit. Things have changed dramatically in Calvert County since then, but this was back in the 60s, and it was still a very backward rural county. And I wasn't much appreciated either because they didn't like outsiders. And uh, so I, actually the executive director to the county commissioners told me that his number one purpose in life was to get rid of me. <laughs> and uh, actually I caught him undermining one of my uh, applications for money from the federal government and um, told the president of the county commissioners about it and I got rid of him. And on the way out, he stopped in my office and said, 
I know you did this to me, and I won't forget it. I'll catch you one way or the other. I know you're here doing something wrong, and I'll catch you one way or the other and get rid of you too. <laughs> a jo um, I formed a group of county leaders to discuss the possible development paths for the county. My accomplishments include getting federal money to develop an industrial park, working with the extension agent to prepare a feasibility study for the production of wine grapes. It's bothered me ever since then that the University of Maryland has really promoted the production of wine grapes in Maryland, but they've never ever given me any credit for doing the first feasibility study about producing wine grapes in Maryland. Actually, the head of the experiment station got uh, cuttings from Cornell for a research plot. And I had already told him not to do that because Cornell used vinifera grapes and they would not grow in our climate. That uh, there was a, a winery in Baltimore County called Bordy's Winery, B-O-O-R-D-Y. It was a an Americanization of Bordeaux. And so I told him they ought to get cuttings from that winery and plant those. So when the cuttings came from Cornell, I just threw them, threw them in the waste can and went up to Bordy's Vineyard and got cuttings up there and planted them in the research plot and they did wonderful. And I also terraced a hillside behind my house and planted some there too and they did wonderful too. Um, but um, the, uh, I also helped them develop a plan and a county organization to build a county airport, helped the county hire a county manager, and coordinated the county government with a nuclear power plant being built by the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company uh, on these, uh, along the Chesapeake Bay. It was a very interesting and productive experience for me. While working at the Department of Agriculture and in Calvert County, I had been teaching part-time at the University of Maryland. An offer came to me to teach full-time at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. Having a desire to return to the academic world, I took the job and we moved to Ohio in 1972. This was a very good move for my whole family and I had an excellent experience as a full-time teacher in the economics department. Well, here is where I first began to take the experiences from my life and use them in the classroom. I was able to turn them into tools to teach economic concepts and to teach about life in general. Somewhere in my thinking, I had always wanted to operate my own business. In 1975, my brother and I launched Brothers Ford Tractor in Leitersburg, where I had grown up six miles north of Hagerstown. My brother and I began rebuilding the dealership with all the other brands having a larger market share. In the first year, sales were $247,000. I took over the business myself after two years, renamed it Antietam Ford Tractor, promoted my parts man to manager, and returned to work at the Department of Agriculture. The daily commute to Washington made it very difficult to operate a full-time business. In 1979, Hagerstown Community College offered me a full-time job as professor of economics. I took the job and allowed my manager to continue to run the business for me. I handled finances, bookkeeping, advertising, and inventory. By 1985, our annual sales had increased to $2 million, and my manager wanted a dealership of his own. I also wanted to take a sabbatical leave, so I sold the business to my manager and took a sabbatical to Yale University. My former manager has done well with the business and is now the largest dealership in the area with annual sales of $14 million. When I owned the business, I stocked six tractors. He now stocks 60 tractors, and um, I, I would really he has something like three and a half million dollars in inventory that he's paying interest on. I would really worry about that, but he has done one thing that I never thought about, that it was a brilliant thing. Every year between Christmas and New Year's, he has a disposal sale, and he sells all of the used equipment that he has. And usually this sale 
totals over a million dollars. So that gives you some idea that when you trade in something, every time you sell something new, you trade something in, and eventually you accumulate all this stuff, and you tie up all of your money in this used equipment. Well, now he has a way of disposing of it all and freeing up his money. From my experience in the farm equipment business, I can share with my students stories about hiring and managing employees, sales and advertising, and managing inventory. I also learned how to develop business policies. To my surprise, not all farmers paid their bills, and I had to design a credit policy. Farmers are not all mechanics. Some don't even know how to clean their battery cables in order to get their tractor started. My year at Yale in 1985-86 was a turning point in my life. My academic reason for going to Yale was to watch other teachers teach the same courses I taught. Yale had a reputation of doing an international search to fill teaching positions in order to acquire the best teachers possible. I was not disappointed. I gained a lot from observing Yale teachers. They had a way of touching each student individually. I also set in on graduate level economics courses and brought my own knowledge up to date. Professor, Professor James Tobin, a Nobel Prize winner, taught a graduate macroeconomics course. It was an extremely useful e academic experience. But I had another reason for this sabbatical, a trip into the desert. I was very disappointed in my personal life. As a Christian, I was aware that Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I felt I had no life at all. When I arrived in New Haven, I started attending a church about a block away from the house where I rented an attic room. I asked the pastor if he would meet with me for counseling. In our second session, he told me, your life is hopeless. You were treated so harshly as a child, you will never develop a positive attitude. He obviously was not going to be of any help. <laughs> By my second semester at Yale, I had run out of economics courses to experience. So I selected history courses and one in the Divinity School, Christian Morality and Spiritual Growth. The course was taught by a nun, Sister Margaret Farley, yet she did not look like a nun. She did not wear a nun's habit, but gray skirts, gray or blue blazers, turtleneck sweaters, and modest jewelry. She was an amazing teacher, making contact with every student individually. The students did not address her as Professor Farley, but rather as Sister Margaret. In the summer after I left Yale, I wrote an article for Yale Alumni Magazine called A Teacher's Presence. And I included about four different teachers in my article, including her. And they put her picture on the cover. And as you can, I know you can't see it very clearly, but you can see she's not dressed like we usually think a nun would look. And that summer I went back up and I looked her up and she wanted to know how I was doing, and I said, I was, I'm doing fine, and I owe it all to you. And I said, but I have paid you back. She says, how have you paid me back? I said, I've made you a cover girl. <laughs> she didn't think that was funny. Uh, I asked her if she would meet with me for counseling. She agreed, and in our first session, I poured out my sorry life and said that nothing good ever happens to me. She replied, you're at Yale, aren't you? Uh, she was right. It was indeed a privilege for a community college teacher to do a sabbatical at Yale as a visiting fellow. And um, she went on to point out that my concept of God was wrong. She said that I thought of God like Santa Claus. Give me this, give me that, fix this, fix that. She, she pointed out in the New Testament how many times we're told to pray thankfully. She said, there are many things in my life for which to be thankful. I just had to focus on them. It was difficult, but she was right. This was a turning point for me, and I learned many life-changing things. These are not always things to be shared with my students, but rather things that made me a better teacher. I worked on my meeting and greeting skills. I learned better how to socialize with others, 
including college staff, and made many new friends. I learned that to have a friend, you must first be a friend. I learned better how to deal with my students as individuals, all different with unique potential. I upgraded and polished my knowledge of economics and history by listening to other teachers with greater expertise. I learned new and more interesting teaching techniques using history and culture. I learned that I had much in my life for which to be thankful and needed to focus on these things and not be so negative. When I returned to Hagerstown Community College, I felt that many things had improved in my life. My teaching was more effective as I tried to address each student as an individual and to teach economics using history and culture. I also related to people better as I made a deliberate attempt to greet people and to show an interest in their lives. I also was leading a more thankful life and that improved my attitude. That sabbatical was such a productive and positive experience, I decided I wanted to take another one. I thought very seriously about it and decided I wanted to go abroad and teach. I learned about the Fulbright program and carefully selected a country that I thought would not attract many applicants. I picked Czechoslovakia and won a Fulbright there to teach in 1992-93. This was a beginning of a long involvement in both Central and Eastern Europe. I arrived at the University of Agriculture in Nitra, Czechoslovakia, it eventually became Slovakia, but at that time it was Czechoslovakia, in September 1992. It was still Czechoslovakia, but it divided into the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic on January 1, 1993. The Velvet Revolution, as it was called, occurred during my sabbatical there. Yet, for me, it was a very scary experience. At midnight on December 31, 1992, I awoke to tremendous explosions. I, looking out the window, I discovered that people were hurling fireworks off the tops of apartment buildings. And these had to be homemade fireworks because they were, when they went off, there was a tremendous explosion and you could see this fire burst in the middle of the air. I don't know how they got all these explosives to do that. The following day, January 1, 1993, the country had been divided into the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. It was called the Velvet Revolution because the division was so peacefully accomplished. Yet, just to ensure peacefulness of the division, soldiers armed with submachine guns were at every government building, bank, and post office, and many street intersections. The university gave me their best students, and it was indeed a pleasant teaching experience. I taught farm management and environmental economics. Another American and I bought a car and alternated the use of it on a week-by-week -week basis. It allowed us to tour the country and also drive into the Czech Republic, Austria, and Hungary. We traveled to Krakow, Poland by train, stayed with a friend, and toured the Wawel Castle and the Auschwitz concentration camp. After I returned to America, I had six Slovak students come to America for a visit at different times. I took them to visit farms, Washington, Williamsburg, and the Norfolk Naval Base. My son was career Navy, and so he could get me onto the Norfolk Naval Base. They were all shocked at the immense size of aircraft carriers. Of course, Slo Slovakia is a landlocked country, so they had very little contact with ships. But they couldn't imagine that that thing so big didn't just fall over. And I told them, well, there's as much under the water as there is above the water. And uh, so anyway, this was a real uh, experience for them to see all these ships. They had never even been remotely connected with, a, with naval ships before. I also had the opportunity for a Fulbright group trip to Poland for a month, which Stan has already referenced, and to Hungary for two weeks and to Moldova for three weeks. The Moldova trip was as a consultant to help them export grain and oil seeds. In 2000, I was eligible for another sabbatical and applied to go to Hungary to teach. The Fulbright office called me and told me I came in second for Hungary. 
but there was a position open in Ukraine. At the time, I thought all Central and Eastern European countries were similar, so I accepted the position in Ukraine. In August 2000, I was sent to Bielitserkva State Agrarian University, about 70 miles south of Kiev. Imagine my shock when I arrived and discovered the average income in Ukraine was $25 to $30 per month, when it had been two to $300 per month in Slovakia. It never occurred to me there was this much difference in income levels in Eastern Europe. No grocery stores as we know them existed in Bielitserkva in 2000. Bread baked locally was plentiful, delicious, and cheap. You could also buy smoked sausage at outdoor kiosks. The only other food available was what you could buy from village ladies along the street. Potatoes, onions, turnips, carrots, eggs, that kind of thing. So I made a big pot of soup every Sunday afternoon and seasoned it with smoked sausage. I ate soup and bread all week, except one evening I would have eggs. There was no ice cream, no candy bars, no potato chips. I lost 30 pounds while I was there. <laughs> and I came home and gained 50 pounds. <laughs> that winter in Bilozirkva was beyond description. It snowed every day, a blinding blizzard. They don't bother to remove snow, they just shuffle through it. They deal with snow the same way they deal with everything else. You just drink more vodka. The students I was given for my classes were not among the best, as had been the case in Slovakia. I had the feeling the students were just rounded up for me and assigned to my classes. I taught farm management and environmental economics again. It was a real cultural shock for both the students and for me. They were accustomed to the teacher delivering to them a long-used lecture. In the next class, the teacher would call on them and they would jump to attention and recite back what he had read to them in the previous class. When I asked them to think about alternative solutions to problems, such as the disaster at Chernobyl, they were stunned. They, they had never engaged in problem solving. It, didn't, it w was not part of their education to think of alternative ways of solving a problem. You just memorized everything the teacher said and give it back to him, and that was all there was to it. During the first exam, they were running around the room, copying from each other and looking up answers in the book. I stopped from them from doing this, and they were in a state of disbelief. I also had students trying to buy grades. I survived my teaching experience, but it was a great challenge, and what I have told you does not come close to describing all the difficulties I ran into while teaching. I didn't have a car in Ukraine, but was able to travel to Kiev by bus and see many tourist attractions, such as St. Sophia's Cathedral, the Caves Monastery, the Memorial for 8 million Ukrainians, Stalin starved to death in the 1930s, the World War II Museum, which has on top of it an aluminum statue um, of a woman with a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. And the thing is so high, they had to reroute the planes landing at the Kiev airport because they were afraid the planes were going to run into it. Um, the, um, this sits atop of the World War II Museum. They don't call it World War II. They call it the Great Patriotic War Against Fascism. Sometimes I wondered if America was included in fascism. I didn't know, but anyway, they called it the Great Patriotic War Against Fascism. Um, I also was able to go to Babin Yar, which is a ravine outside Kiev where the Nazis used to kill people, shoot them. It's not a concentration camp. It was a killing ravine. And they killed over 100,000 people there. Um, one of the interesting stories, there's a book written about it. The book is entitled Dynamo. And that was the name of the Kiev soccer team, Dynamo. And the German army had a pickup team that wanted to play the German Dynamo, or the Ukrainian Dynamo team. And they ordered the, the Kiev team to lose. The Kiev team could not bring themselves to lose. They won. 
So they loaded them on a bus, took them out to Bob and Yar, and shot them. You know, end of story. And when my student guide was showing me around, he said in the summertime when they're mowing this park, that bones come up through the soil. I said, really? Doesn't it make you feel strange to be walking around on the graves of 100,000 murdered people? He said, no, it's just a park to me. And uh, <laughs> I couldn't think of it that way, but that's the way he thought of it. I think it's one of these things where older people have a different way, different perspective of things than younger people have. I was also, oh, and then this monument also is in Kiev of the Vikings that came there and founded Kiev. Uh, there's also a, a steep street called St. Andrew's Descent where there are vendors of all types on each side selling souvenirs left over from World War II. And I bought my wife some uh, articles for her Ukrainian folk costume there and all kinds of things. And at the bottom of St. Andrew's Descent, I have a picture of a lady who's begging. She has nine dogs, and she's begging for money to feed her dogs. And uh, I don't know how in the world she managed to get nine dogs, but she has nine of them. And they were all there with her, all sitting, staring hungrily, uh, asking you to give money. I was also taken to Odessa on the Black Sea and saw the steps leading down to the harbor where the 1905 silent film, The Battleship Potemkin, was made. That trip involved a marvelous drive through the steppe where you could see for many miles because the land was so flat and the sky so clear. The soil of the steppe is very black and nine feet deep. I returned to Slovakia with my wife Susan in the fall of 2005, and we spent a wonderful semester there teaching and learning. During that trip, we flew to Ukraine and visited Bielitserkva for nine days. That led to a discussion about returning to Ukraine to teach. Therefore, we did return to Bielitserkva in February 2008 and stayed until June 2008. Although we encountered some of the same difficulties as seven years previous, we gain much from our time of living and teaching in a foreign culture. Here are some of the things I learned or found especially interesting from living and working in Eastern Europe. We can't possibly imagine the differences that exist among various cultures of the world. A primary difference relates to time. America has a very German culture. Things happen at a very specific time and are well planned and organized. In Slavic cultures, the tendency is to be more relaxed, whatever, whenever, however. In November 2007, it was decided I would teach environmental economics in the spring 2008 semester at Bielitserkva. I upgraded my lectures, reviewed my writing assignments, and arrived with all my material ready to teach. Upon arrival, they informed me that I was going to teach American history and culture instead. I told them I never taught that before, course before and didn't bring any material along to teach that course. Their reply was, it doesn't matter. You know more about it than our students, <laughs> which I guess was true. <laughs> anyway, I put more emphasis on culture, and it did turn out to be a very interesting course. I didn't give them tests. I knew I could flunk them all out if I gave them tests. So I gave them three writing assignments. The first was, what did the founding fathers of America do right that turned America into such a strong, attractive, and wealthy country? Well, only one student came up with an idea and said that encouraging people to export natural resources was a right thing to do. The second question was, what could Abraham Lincoln have done to prevent the Civil War? Nobody had any answers to that. I said he could have bought the slaves' freedom instead of just declaring them free. That probably wouldn't have cost any more than the Civil War cost. And the third question was, what could the U.S. or the USSR have done to prevent the Cold War? Eight students said that if the U.S. had shared its secrets of the atomic bomb, 
with the Soviet Union, that would have prevented the Cold War. I said, don't you realize that the Soviet Union had already infiltrated the Manhattan Project with spies, and they already had all the secrets to the atomic bomb? We would have gained nothing from giving them anything. They already had all the secrets. Well, they didn't know that, but they thought that was interesting, uh, that the Soviet Union had the secrets but didn't do anything with them. Anyway, um, the people of Eastern Europe are very kind and hospitable. I was often invited to meals even though my hosts had very little themselves. You also must be cautious about admiring anything or they'll insist that you take it. Some interesting information isn't always obtained from history books, but it can only be acquired firsthand from the people who experienced it. In sharing an office with the chair of the language department, I witnessed old people coming to get a letter written in German into the town where they had been sent as slave labor as teenagers. During World War II on the Eastern Front, the German supply trains did not return to Germany empty. The gondola cars were filled with black soil from Ukraine and the boxcar were filled with teenagers taken back to Germany as slave labor. In 2001, Germany had started a program to pay these people according to how long they had worked there. I was able to hear many stories of terrible things that happened to these people both boys and girls as slave labor in Germany. When you live or travel in foreign countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, don't talk much about your possessions. You may or may not have much by American standards, but you most certainly have a lot by their standards. Eastern Europe may be, Eastern Europeans may be interested in what you have, but they will also think you are arrogant when you tell them it sounds like bragging. I was invited to supper one evening and was on the 12th floor of a very shabby apartment building. And the man asked me if I had a car. And I said, yes, I have a Mazda and a Mini Cooper and a pickup truck and two tractors and an MG and a Model T Ford. And I could see he was in a state of shock. He couldn't believe that I would try to brag that I had all this stuff. He couldn't imagine somebody having all that stuff. They had no car at all. They relied on public transportation. So after that, I became much more careful about replying to their questions about possessions. Many Ukrainians also believe that life was better under communism. Don't be incredulous when they express this to you. We may find it difficult to understand as we revel in freedom and love to think for ourselves. But they have been conditioned not to think, but simply do what they were told. You may like the, they may like the idea of freedom, but do not understand the huge responsibilities that go along with being free. There's no way to explain all the ways that we learn and grow and benefit when we live and work among people of another culture. I encourage students to take any and all opportunities to travel and live in other cultures. I have concluded that all Americans would benefit from living in another culture for a time. Americans would have a revelation about how good we have it. As I said, my wife and I returned to Beale Cirque for to teach in spring 2008. It was obvious the economy had improved remarkably since the Orange Revolution and since the seven years since I had been there. There were three to four times as many automobiles. I actually saw a Cadillac Escalade and a Hummer. And I asked people, how, how did they afford to buy something like that? And they said, the same way you do, with credit. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. I didn't know they had credit. <laughs> In Bila Zirkva, there were three supermarkets and four bazaars where vendors can rent space to sell their products. Yet I was disturbed by the trash everywhere. During my American history course, I asked the students why there was so much trash everywhere. Why do you throw things down and never pick it up? They replied no one had told them to pick it up. They also replied that, no, that it was the government's job to clean up the trash. It wasn't their job. So you have a completely different point of view uh, 
about, they're not accustomed to assuming responsibility for their own behavior. Uh, the government will take care of it. We all can use life experiences as a teaching tool. Everyone has experiences that can be used to illustrate academic material, whether in economics, literature, the social sciences, mathematics, or other subjects. Although I draw much from my experiences in Central and Eastern Europe, there is also much from my American experience, experiences available as teaching tools. Uh, in 1929, there was a serious economic change in the era of the big band, swing dancing, and extravagant Hollywood musicals emerged. These cultural changes make the era's economics more interesting and understandable. So many of our life experiences can be used to illustrate academic concepts, and all we need to do is present them in an interesting and creative way. It is really not too difficult, and it makes teaching and learning much more fun. If we're going to use life experiences in the classroom, they have to have a human interest to engage the students and to illustrate the academic point. We have all had life experiences that can be used to illustrate academic concepts if they are presented in a way that makes the material more interesting and not more confusing. It's that simple. Remember that we who are older may have life experiences that occurred in an earlier time and may have no relevance to students today. I have found that students, that stories about my experiences at Leitersburg Elementary School with outside toilets and the teachers all using paddles does not connect with present day school experience. They, they just don't understand. Perhaps we can consider our classes as restaurants where we can offer an inviting menu, well prepared food and prompt and thoughtful service. We should always think about problems and issues in integrated ways, seeing connections between multiple perspectives. We should be thinking about how to create a learning experience based on learner needs as much as possible. Or, or I'm sorry, as much as possible, we should move more and more away from the old method of memorization to a new method of relating to the knowledge. This is not to say that teachers have not been using good, even great teaching methods for years, for they have. It is only to remind ourselves that dispensing life experiences is a fun and useful alternative to dispensing information. Life experiences connect with the student's existing knowledge structure and gives abstract and theoretical concepts a human dimension. We should not hesitate to do, that, do this as it makes learning more interesting and easier. If we can use life experience stories to initiate a class discussion, you have succeeded in connecting with the students, engaging their interest and helping them learn a concept. They have understood your story well enough to discuss it and have sufficient interest to ask questions. This indicates understanding and will lead to deeper insight. Thank you very much. If you have any questions,